the temperatures are on the rise. And as is normally the case, as the temperatures rise, the clothes in our culture begin to come off. Such is the nature of our society. And as is often the case, our society and culture is influencing the church more than the church is influencing our culture. And that's sad. But it's reality nonetheless. The problem is everywhere. It's difficult, if not impossible, to even simply go outside and be a part of the neighborhood or go to any public place without being somehow exposed to immodesty. But one of the reasons that the problem continues, and especially as I reference its continuance in the church among Christians, is because the teaching regarding modesty, at least in my experience, has always been too vague. Most of the sermons that I have heard that address the issue are basically summed up this way. Let's all be modest. And everybody says amen. But seldom does anyone ever get around to explaining biblically what modesty is. I would imagine that everybody in this assembly today, if they were asked, do you always wear modest clothing? I would imagine everyone would say, absolutely. I don't wear immodest clothing. But if everyone were asked, to define from a biblical standpoint what all of those terms in those modesty passages mean, I wonder if many of us have gone to the places that we need to go to to find the definitions of those terms. We just all assume, based upon personal experience, cultural considerations, something that we're modest, and that may not necessarily be the case. And so, with our lessons today, I've entitled them Straight Talk About Modesty. The lesson this morning and the one tonight will do much more than just simply say, let's all be modest. Because we all know that. But do we understand what it means to be modest as the Bible defines those terms? You see, our culture will define them in a lot of ways. The resident of the nudist colony will say that's modest, given their definition of modest. But how does God define the terms? That's what we'll be discussing today. This morning's lesson will focus on defining the terms biblically and giving an example, an illustration of modesty. And then tonight's lesson will center on objections that are often raised. Tonight's lesson will focus on specifically uh, statements that I have personally heard that people have made over the years that I have had opportunity to deal with the issue and statements that have been made to justify immodesty. We'll cover those tonight and then give some general principles as well that need to be considered and addressed. And so this morning, let's consider first of all, modesty demanded. Modesty demanded. The passage was read just a moment ago, 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 and 10. 
that specifically addresses women. Let me say at the outset, modesty principles apply to men as well. And so while much of what may be said in these lessons is directed toward women because the biblical passages are directed that way, understand that modesty applies to men as well. 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 and 10. Now, definitions of terms don't make for the most interesting sermons. But words mean things, do they not? Words have definitions. And so, in order for us to grasp what these passages say, we've got to understand what the words mean. It's not like uh, one of the characters in Alice in Wonderland, I forget which one it was, who said, a word means what I intend for it to mean. It doesn't work that way. Words have meanings, and so let's attempt to discover what those meanings are. And the first one, Paul says, 1 Timothy 2, 9, let the women adorn themselves. The word adorn means, or actually it comes from, the word that gives us our word, cosmetics. Cosmane is the Greek word, and we get cosmetics from that. It carries with it a similar idea, to arrange, to put in order to decorate in some fashion. And so when Paul says women are to adorn themselves, he's talking about how women are to present themselves, how they are to uh, uh, show themselves to be presentable, attractive, decorated, for a, you know, to, to, to use that term in that sense, adorn themselves. And I've given you, incidentally, on all these definitions, the um, uh, lexicons and other dictionaries from which these definitions have come. So, how to be presentable? Adorn themselves in modest apparel. What does that word mean? By definition, orderly, moderate, proper, respectable, honorable, decent. Those are all synonyms for this word. Well, that doesn't give us any definitions as far as length or anything like that, as far as uh, clothing goes, but we'll get to that. Adorn themselves in modest apparel. Clothing, of course, but interestingly, the lexicons also say this about the word apparel, that it refers not just to clothing as such, though in some cases it does, but also the outward deportment as it is expressed through clothing. What does that tell us? It tells us that we can learn something of the character of a person based upon what that person chooses to wear. There's a connection between the Outward, it's an outward show of an inward character. File that one away also in your mind. With shamefacedness, King James, shamefastness, American Standard, propriety, New King James, lots of different terms used to uh, translate that word, but here is its definition. Feminine reserve in matters of sex a sense of shame, a moral repugnance for doing anything dishonorable, an attitude that shrinks from surpassing the limits of womanly reserve, as well as from the dishonor which would justly attach thereto. That's what the lexicons say. Dress with propriety, reserve with regard to sensual matters. And it speaks of that inner desire to not surpass those reservation limits, lest one be given an attachment of dishonor, and that justly so. Shamefastness. But it also is defined this way. It implies a self-respect as well as, and please note this, as well as restraint imposed upon oneself from a sense of what is due others. So part of what needs to go into our decisions and choices on what we wear is a sense of compassion or a sense of obligation towards something that's due to other people. So I must consider not just myself and what I choose to wear, I have to consider others also. That is, if I'm going to dress in this way. Sobriety. 
speaks of having control of the sexual passions and desires. It can be defined as decency, moderation, expression of self-control. All of these things carry the idea, all of these terms carry the idea of dressing in such a way as not to cause undue attention to be drawn through any kind of vain display, whether it be through the, the incitement of sensual desires in someone else or through material extravagance. Those things are to be avoided in the way we dress. Now, if you take all of these terms and their definitions and give kind of a summary statement, pulling all of those things together, this is what you end up with. In seeking to make oneself presentable to others, adorn, one should dress in an orderly, moderate, reserved, and decent way, in a way that expresses one's Christian character. One's dress should not promote sexuality, sensuality, or material extravagance, but instead should show others that one is reserved and self-controlled, having mastered one's physical appetites. That's what the passage means. And if we don't take into consideration those principles when we choose our wardrobe, we're not doing as God would have us to do. Now, those are the terms defined. But is there anything in Scripture that indicates what God views as fitting into that category, specifically from a modesty standpoint, from, from, a, uh, uh, from a length of clothing standpoint? We're not, for the, for the purpose of this lesson, uh, addressing the material extravagance angle, which Paul does address here, and so does Peter in 1 Peter 3, about the, the, the plating of the hair and the wearing of jewelry and things like that. Those passages do not prohibit the wearing of jewelry uh, completely any more than they prohibit the wearing of any kind of clothing. 1 Peter 3, 3 says, uh, let the woman's uh, adornment not be in clothing, or these other things. Well, he's not prohibiting wearing the all clothing completely. He's talking about the material extravagance thing. Don't let the, uh, the impression be simply through the outward expressions of material extravagance or uh, sensuality. We're going to address just the sensual angle this morning and tonight. So is there anything in Scripture that would give us an example that would give us some kind of an illustration as what God would say fits into the category of modest. I believe there is. And it comes at the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, we have in that passage a positive example of what God considers to be adequate clothing. And so, if there is an example, and there is, where God clothed someone, is there anything we can learn about what God clothed them with and how much God clothed them that would give us an indication of what God might expect of us? I believe we learned that in Genesis 3. You recall that um, at the time of the creation, Adam and Eve didn't have clothes on initially. And there was no shame associated with that. Genesis 2.25 says they were both naked and were not ashamed. But when sin entered the picture and became a reality, public nudity, if you will, took on a whole new meaning. And God clothed Adam and Eve. What's interesting is, in addition to those points, is that the first thing that Adam and Eve tried to do whenever they realized that they had committed sin and were without clothing, the first thing they tried to do was cover themselves up in some fashion. They recognized that they needed at that point to be covered. And so they sewed fig leaves together, the text says, Genesis 3, 7, and made for themselves aprons. You'll find different translations uh, that define or translate this word in different ways. Aprons is the uh, word used in King James, American Standard, Revised Standard. Coverings, New King James, NIV. Loin coverings or loin cloths, New American and ESV. 
Berkeley uh, translated it skirt, young, and the footnote of the ASV translates the term girdle. So when Adam and Eve got their fig leaves together, don't let, incidentally, the old paintings and pictures define for us what those things look like. You look at the old paintings and pictures that people have come up with, a lot of times you've got one small twig with a few leaves on it that are placed in strategic locations to make the pictures printable and publishable. You ever realize that, that taking a branch with a few leaves on it did not require any kind of sewing? But what did Adam and Eve do? They sewed together leaves and made for themselves loin coverings. As you define and translate that word, you end up with basically this. They sewed together fig leaves and created for them coverings that cover about as much territory as modern men's boxers or modern women's mini skirts. That's about what they covered, loin coverings. And so, God comes to find them. Walking in the garden, and God says, Adam, where are you? He said, I've hid myself because I was naked. And God looked at Adam and said, Adam, what do you mean, naked? You've got plenty of clothes on. You're very well covered. What you've done for yourself is fine. It wasn't God's response, was it? God didn't argue the point with him. God did not take Adam to task over his definition of nakedness. He just simply wanted Adam to reveal to him, how'd you come to know that? It's clear that God wasn't satisfied with what Adam and Eve had made for themselves because He made them something else. Adam had reached an accurate conclusion that he was inadequately clothed. And the Greek lexicons tell us that sometimes the term translated naked means or can mean either without clothing completely or inadequately clothed. From God's vantage point, it's all the same. Inadequate clothing is not enough. And so God fixes their nakedness problem by making for them coats, King James, American Standard. Uh, some translations will have the word tunic or garment of some kind, but notice the definition. Words have meaning. What did God make for them? Read the definition yourself from Swanson's Dictionary of Biblical Languages. Clothing as a covering, more complete than a loincloth, a basic garment reaching the knees, and so a common garment for common wear and work, and he cites Genesis 3.21 as an example of that. When God inspired Moses to write the book of Genesis and record for us what it was that God made for Adam and Eve, this is the Hebrew word he chose. What did God make? He made a garment that covered to the knees. The Hebrew word ketone. The Greek corresponding word to that that's used in the Septuagint translation sounds much the same, keton. It's defined in this way, a garment having armholes and sometimes sleeves and reaching below the knees. That from Wesley Pershbacher's analytical Greek lexicon. What did God make for them? Was it like most of the paintings and pictures we've seen? It was some kind of thing of animal skins that looked more like a leotard than it did anything else? Not if words mean things. And not if we allow the words to be defined as they really are. 
It was a garment that reached from the shoulders to the knees. And so, God's actions certainly imply that the hip covering skirts or aprons that they wore were inadequate. Elsie would not have clothed them. They were still naked in his eyes. So what does that say by way of application, men? Do we go out in public places? No shirts? Some kind of small shorts on where others can see us in that condition? Seems to be the condition Adam was in. God said, Adam, inadequate. Here was an opportunity for God to give a positive example of something that he considers to be adequate clothing. And it extended from the neck and shoulders to the knees. I know that clothing that covers that much is modest. Else God would not have made it for Adam and Eve. Is there a passage that would illustrate an indication of any kind that something less than that still qualifies as modest? If the passage is there, I've not yet come across it. But I could be wrong. If the passage can be found that indicates something different, I am more than willing to accept that. but the passage must exist. We must dress in the way God wants us to dress if we're concerned about God's will at all. Modesty is not preacher talk. It's not the idea that a group of elders got together and came up with on their own. It's in the Bible. And we've got to study to see exactly what the Word says and what the words that God chose to use mean. I think we've looked at that this morning. God does not want us to dress ourselves in ways that are either materially extravagant nor sensually enticing. And He has helped us in some way to have some idea as to what that means by the example left for us in Genesis chapter 3. Modesty, incidentally, is one of those principles that transcends all covenants. Is there a passage that indicates that from Genesis 3 to now that God has changed His view on what He considers to be modest? I know not the passage. If it's there, I'm willing to see it. But, like we said, we know this is modest. If I go out in something less, I'm doing something for which I cannot produce biblical sanction. How do we want to live our lives? Going out on our own? Risk it? Or does not the Bible present the case that we should do those things for which we have authority and not go out on our own? There's an example in Scripture of a couple from unclothed to inadequately clothed, ending with God choosing the wardrobe for them. And that's what we have. Tonight, the Lord willing, if I make it out those back doors alive, 
will consider common objections. What, what have some said in the past to this material? We'll consider those tonight, at least a few of them, uh, the, the major ones that I've heard in the past, and see what uh, the Bible would have to say about those objections. Our purpose in this is simply to draw attention to some matters that practically everyone in the world seems to have no idea about, and far too many in the church, that are either ignorant of these principles and points, or they've chosen a cafeteria-style Christianity, or they simply pick and choose the principles that they want to live by and reject the others. Or perhaps some are new to the faith and are simply in the process of growing and learning. But in either of those cases, in all of those cases, there needs to be a recognition of these truths and an acceptance of them. My prayer is, and my hope, is that we'll all think about these things and be concerned about what God would have us to do in every area of our lives, including in the choices we make when we purchase our clothing, because God's concerned about it, whether we are or not. If you look in your life today and you find sin, whether it be regarding some of the things we've talked about this morning or some other area of your life, sin that would demand of you a public acknowledgement and repentance and prayer, then let us help you today to get your life right with God. If you're not a Christian, please know that Jesus died for you and wants you to be saved. But you must come to Him on His terms. Believe in Him, repent of your sins, and be baptized. If we can help you to do that this morning, please let us, while we stand together and sing.